This lecture is called More Distributions, and the reason I want to talk a little bit about distributions or additional distributions is um, for a couple of reasons. Um, we've learned uh, how to plot distributions, their frequency and relative frequency, describe the shape, central tendency, and variability. And by that, what I mean is that we can calculate terms like mean, median, and mode. We can calcu calculate variance and standard deviation. Those are um, part and parcel of the description of uh, distributions. Now, before I move on, though, I want to show you some special distributions that can be really useful in science. And this is the jumping off point, really, for inferential statistics. And that is that we're going to view a distribution of outcomes and try to place it in context. We're going to take a sample, construct a distribution, or, or consider it in a, in a distri distributional character, or the distributional character of a sample, and try to draw conclusions or inferences or educated guesses or best guesses about what the population might be. But before going on, um, <clears throat> let's talk about a gambling experiment. And that is, now what if I had 10 six-sided dice, you know, just these, these little dice over here. I had 10 of them, and I roll them, and I recorded how many sixes come up. This would be a gambling experiment. And let's say I do this a million times. Now sometimes I roll one six out of 10. Sometimes I roll nine sixes out of 10. Sometimes I roll four or zero. And here are all the data. I just, I just rolled the 10 die. And I counted how many sixes I had. The first time I rolled ten, I got two sixes. Then I got one six. Then I got five sixes. Then I got three. Then I got two. Then I got one. And then what I did was I took these data and summarized them in a relative frequency distribution and a frequency distribution. And here's what that looks like. Here's the number of sixes. I can get zero sixes out of ten. I can get ten out of ten and all the options in between. And when I did this last night, I got 161,506 times I rolled these 10 die, I got zero sixes. And that relative frequency we have here. Now, did I do this experiment a million times? Well, of course I did. I'll, I'll do anything for you. Okay, now really, I cheated a bit. I know that the expected results, the relative frequencies, would be described by a particular distribution called the binomial. That is, that I looked at the features of the experiment, and we know we have uh, 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 an expectation of what the outcome is going to be. The expected relative proportions of sixes is described by a mathematical function we call the binomial distribution. And using that formula, I computed the relative proportion, and I plotted it here. And this is a binomial distribution of outcomes. Uh, related to rolling dice, uh, 10 die. Now, the binomial is not a single distribution, but a family of distributions that have common mathematical properties. Binomial distributions can look very different from one another depending on features of the experiment. And if you can identify two and only two outcomes of an experimental observation, you can use a binomial. This is really, really valuable. So, for example, if you can identify two and only two outcomes of an experimental life, uh, what situation might we have when we can identify only two, two and only two outcomes? Well, what about a true-false exam? What about gender, male versus female? What about when you play a game and then you either win or lose? Those are two and only two outcomes. And if you do an experiment on games, on, um, on gender, on uh, uh, various things, and if you Id can identify uh, two and only two um, outcomes, then you have a binomial. True, false exams, success or failure, six or not six, good, bad, dead, alive, zero, one. So there's a lot of alternatives. There's a lot of situations in which the binomial distribution uh, can provide help. Now, let's say I do a physics experiment. I have a lump of radioactive material which emits a particle every so often, but I can't predict when the next particle will be emitted. There's none. There's one. There's one. There's one. Now. Now. So I can't predict when this lump of material is going to emit a radioactive particle, but I can record each time the particle was emitted. Let's describe another experiment. There's a big concert coming to Madison or Whitewater and lines of uh, to buy tickets will be really long. How long will your wait be? 
Well, no one knows because the people in front of you, sometimes they take a long time. Sometimes they pay with cash. Sometimes they pay with credit card. Sometimes they have to uh, write a check. Some people are buying two tickets. Some people are buying eight tickets. Some people want to look at where their seats are. Some people are going to take what You never know how long you're going to wait in a line when you're buying tickets to something. Now, we can record how long each person takes at the window. We call that window time. And your wait, how long you're going to wait, is the sum of all the window times of the people in front of you. Let's say there's another experiment that I uh, would like to call your attention to, and that is uh, imagine that you're in the Prussian army in the mid-1800s, and basically Prussia is equal to Germany plus Poland. It was a large country in the, um, in the 1800s in Europe. And army officers, believe it or not, are getting kicked to death by their horses. Now, you can't predict when the next officer is going to get kicked to death, but you record the date and time of each kicked in the head by a horse death. Now, inter-event times are a special sort of data that we record in, uh, 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 in, in a variety of scientific disciplines. It's the time between any two events or any two things that we've measured. So the time between the emission of any two consecutive atomic particle, particles is an inter-event time. The time between the start of the concert ticket transaction for one person and the start of the ticket transaction for the next is an inter-event time. We call that window time. The time between kicked in the head by a horse death in the, in the Prussian army, that's also an inter-event time. Are these similar distributions? Am I making a point here? Absolutely. The results of the previous three experiments are well described by the Poisson distribution. And he was a Prussian working on the kicked in the head problem, believe it or not. He was studying uh, people getting kicked to death, soldiers getting kicked to get death by uh, horses in the Prussian army. Interesting thing about a Poisson distribution is that the mean is equal to the standard deviation. And that's kind of neat. That's a little, little side fact. It's not really relevant. The Poisson distribution, again, is not a single distribution, but a family of distributions. And it's useful for calculating the expected relative frequency of many time-based problems, like the one used as an example. It's especially useful for waiting line problems. So we know that if you were working in consumer psychology, for example, like you're interested in increasing the customer service or increasing the, um, the uh, uh, positive experience that people have when buying things, you want to make their line, them, them waiting in line, that time as short as possible. And that's a waiting line problem, so you would be using the Poisson distribution. Now, if you don't believe me that the Poisson distribution isn't about getting kicked to, to death by a, by a horse, you can read this little part over here off of Wikipedia, and that says that the first practical application of this distribution was done by Ladislav Berkovitz in 1898 when he was given the task to investigate the number of soldiers of the Prussian army kicked accidentally, killed accidentally by a horse kick. <laughs> so there you go, believe it or not. Okay, now there are other distributions. The Poisson distribution can be useful for waiting line distribution uh, problems. The binomial distribution can be useful for any time that we have uh, 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 two, basically two and only two outcomes of an experiment. And then there's other ones that you can find out about searching the web, reading books, or playing with Excel. Believe it or not, the Poisson distribution that function, that mathematical function, uh, is, is available in Excel. The binomial distribution function is available in Excel. And a lot of these other ones are as, as well as I'll, I'll tell you about. This is a uniform or rectangular distribution. This is when the relative proportion of every interval of observation is the same. It's called a rect. It sort of looks like a rectangle if you look at it from the side. Or a uniform distribution is sometimes called. This is a negative exp exponential function. We often think that the value of money, although we don't, we don't. That we used to think that the value of money decreases in value exponentially. It actually decreases hyperbolically. This is a little bit different distribution function, but these can be really useful in um, in in science and in psychology. And a very special distribution is the normal distribution, which we've talked already at length about, and we'll be talking a lot more about. So that's it on, uh, on distri more distributions. Um, there's many ways to characterize uh, things, and hopefully some of those are useful to you. You might encounter them. There's a variety of others, hypergeometric distributions and gamma distributions and rally distributions in all sorts of ways. Um, the world seems to uh, have order at a particular um, 
uh, level, and that's what distributions help, help us characterize. Talk to you soon.